I am Paul Raj Manidurai, working as Associate Professor here in Department of Physics, Faculty of Physical Sciences and Mathematics. Uh, we have been long working on solar cells and especially on third generation solar cells because that is based on the principle of photosynthesis. And this has attracted us and of course uh, today we have Professor Dr. K. Kalyanasundaram from uh, Swiss Institute of Technology, Switzerland, who has done his pioneering work for uh, about 32 years in this same theme. So they have the capacity right now to install big panel dye sensitized solar cells in various uh, buildings, malls, airports and most of the other big big buildings. And uh, right now uh, we were just talking and uh, the ambition of their government is by 2020 we will have to construct all the buildings by around uh, without any uh, energy which is going to be extracted or uh, zero uh, consuming buildings, zero energy consuming buildings. So, Professor uh, Dr. Kalyana Sundaram is here with us for a mini course and it was really an eye opening for us and he has given us a lot of information regarding this aspect to work along in disensitized solar cells uh, for a long time right now. Yeah? Thank you. Professor, it's a really a good opportunity for us that you have visited our university. Uh, we really had uh, or you had given us a wide exposure of what's happening in the area of uh, renewable energy and especially in photovoltaics. So, out of your experience, uh, could you please mention some of the ideas starting from what had happened in the past regarding solar cells, the present scenario and what could be the future? Uh, thank you first of all for uh, inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here and interact with your students and researchers. Uh, if you look at the interest uh, globally on uh, as time goes on, the energy demands are growing up because the population is growing up, urban cities are growing up, and so the energy consumption per capita is going up, and uh, pollution also is a big concern. And uh, some of the options like nuclear and coal pollution, people are increasingly aware of it. And uh, so, in the scientific community, as well as public large, as well as political and every front, there is a awareness and need to find alternative energy resources. On one hand to meet the increasing demand, the other hand to make them more green and uh, environmentally protective. And uh, so that's one, is that the demand is going up. And uh, people are saying now increasingly prefer finding renewable green energy routes. And the second point is uh, to keep the cost down. And uh, so over 30, 40 years as we learned first and second generation solar cells and how they work and with the new nanotechnology and nanoscience, there is a the question is can we now do better than what we do before? make it more polyvalent that the solar cells doesn't have to be put on the roof and to go away from this notion that can it replace the window in my house and uh, this kind of question is what stimulates research and uh, so the area that we have been working on essentially falls in this uh, search for third generation solar cells to learn from what we have learned up to now but also bring in emerging technologies like nanosense now to make better cells which are polyvalent. That basically is the goal. So in future, uh, what could be the expectation level? For example, uh, it was difficult for solar cells itself to come out to the public, but it was a demand for the space scientists or the military people and that's the reason why the solar panel had come out and uh, now we have little little solar cells. Of course we can take out anywhere and we can use it as a charger. Uh, the same way when you mentioned that 
initially the solar panels were only finding its place in the roofs now it is in the building windows in future how it could be well the thing is uh, many aspect to it one is the cost uh, efficiency and uh, in terms of cost uh, when people compare different technologies while i want to produce electricity is it uh, cost effective if you use coal or oil or nuclear or this renewable energy uh, then people talk about the cost of solar electricity this is uh, what we call as a grid parity is that every country provides electricity at a given price unit price uh, which is based largely now on uh, fossil fuel generation routes it's like 10 cents in europe uh, per kilowatt hour and uh, the question is can solar also produce electricity at this rate and that's what called as a grid parity but 20 years ago solar pulse very expensive that in outer space situation where you cannot produce electricity in any other way the cost was not an issue but now if you want a very common man to use it the question is why should i put a solar panel if it's going to the electricity from that is going to be more expensive and so for a layman unless the grid parity is met that well i have two options to break power but if the cost is the same then i can tell that look the cost is the same now why can't you use a greener technologies so we save the earth correct from the environment damage correct and uh, this we have reached already in the what we call as the sun belt which is the region between uh, tropic of cancer to capricorn that sun belt region where we get maximum sunlight uh, already there are enough data that this grid parity is already reached and uh, a year ago two years ago even in a big country like india and china the grid parity is there already by early next year so there is no reason anymore whether it is china or india particularly all the countries which are in the sun belt not to use a solar because it's not expensive but then the other attractions to it so in that respect the solar has become sufficiently cheap to have grid parity that now i can more convincingly uh, try to create a situation where economically financially as an attractive proposition okay uh the uh, other thing we during the mini course you had shown us there is a sun belt region where we receive the maximum solar energy or solar radiation now all the countries which we have seen in that sun belt region for example in the part of asia we have most popular country populous country india and then you come down to another uh, not that populous and not that rich countries in africa and uh, in chile so there is a way there, there's a difference between each and every country their economy and their their population now for example i wanted to i can't work with the same strategy to implement the use of solar energy as you were saying that it's a green energy and all these things what is the strategy we we'll have to take up or in your experience could be done where upon we are approaching one way for the most populous countries the other way because they are not equal the other way for the uh, less economic or less populous countries so uh, uh, how could you deal with this situation just to implement that yeah kindly please use the green energy here after so something like that after that if i want to do a campaign kind of a thing Yes, the uh, when we talk about the sun belt region, uh, there are a lot of interest on solar in North America and uh, the whole bit of Northern African bloc. And uh, when you see, before I came here, I myself was curious to see, know where Latin America is on this picture. And uh, a couple of days ago, for example, I was uh, pleased to find out. that the last year and this year 
Uh, Chile has launched something like 140 megawatt solar PV. Uh, I don't remember exactly the name of the place in Chile, but that is labeled as the biggest terrestrial solar power generation in Latin America. In Antofagasta. And uh, they have one already and now there is a second one. And uh, so that's the good news that uh, in the scientific political scenario, Chile is already trying to become the leader in Latin America. And they are energy, uh, in terms of solar radiation uh, per uh, unit area, they are well placed. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the universities also can get sensitized and all the renewable energy interest also looks in that, that here is one country where we have all the potential. We are already made a benchmark to be a leader, that to have sustained and have a rapid growth, then we need to bring the academic community involved and support vigorously. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are many countries in the Northern Hemisphere where we don't get mm -hmm. There are a lot of support for renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no reason why those in the Sun Belt region, uh, particularly if you're talking about Latin America and Chile in particular, uh, they have a lot of sun coming per year. And uh, they are already made the uh, first step. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that way my wish is uh, the renewable energy and the government and the university they all work in tandem mm -hmm. uh, that the solar implementation of the future brings in the second and third generation technology also and not mm -hmm. just to the silicon mm -hmm. because right now what they have done is all first generation silicon solar mm -hmm. but I think if there is a interaction at all levels there is no reason why the second and third generations can also be part of this uh, renewable energy growth in uh, Latin America. So the other question which is there right now in my mind is, say uh, mini course on solar energy harvest. So a lot of people were interested and there are really groups of uh, young kids who are secondary students. They were more interested after seeing the experimental uh, the, uh, how, they, how the panel work and uh, which you had taken it from your place. They were interested and they were also very curious to know how uh, a third generation, what is a third generation solar cells and how it works. And now if you are going to uh, see the same scenario in any house, parents also love it. They also say, yeah, if you are going to study, study solar sciences. But there is some lack, we, the momentum is missing. In the academic and the research area, what could be that momentum which we lack and how could we boost up this momentum? I would like to know it from you. Uh, well, there is this uh, one notion that the uh, developing and working on science is expensive. That if not uh, every scientist, uh, some who are capable of, have an obligation to explain to the public what they are doing, where they are doing. And uh, so particularly if you want to sensitize, uh, I always like the idea of talking to the students and the younger generation because uh, the one hand they are more open to entertaining new ideas because they have not grown with a conventional school of thought and they are very receptive to new ideas, trying out new. And uh, so in that respect, uh, if you can uh, encourage interest, uh, stimulate interest on solar mm -hmm. at the high school level itself before they come to the university, mm -hmm. then uh, it's very fruitful. And uh, that's what we have been trying to do is, uh, and so I, I am pleased is to see that the students here also have, and uh, one way possibly you can do is uh, to have some kind of a science fair and uh, because my personal view all the time is, uh, if you just show schemes on paper, uh, the okay. impact is not always the same as to, to see the real products. So even if it's a primitive one, uh, 
the students have better feel for the whole subject. And uh, so if you're talking about solar cells, you are better off to show them real functional cells. They should be able to handle with them. And uh, so either you run as a part of a science fair or a open, we have an open day every semester for one day. And uh, where if not every lab, we pick lab which are doing nice popular science or which we can explain. Uh, from neuroscience to how the brain works to computer science, to artificial intelligence, to energy. And uh, so we have twice a year, the school, the university organizes a uh, open day and the school teachers they come and uh, you tell them what the exciting things are going on. Yeah. And uh, so the, uh, but the, so it, once it gets to the school level, then it gets to the home. Correct. If, for example, the U.S. Apple, they made a breakthrough because they started giving a size to, to Apple computers to the students. Mm. They immediately, they made an impact at home. Once they used it at uh, school, so the Apple quickly penetrated the market by targeting the students. Mm. So if you want to really make impact, you have to target the students, and particularly when they are young. Correct. And so any open day or uh, once a year, mm. science fair or science workshop. That would have... Uh, that could even if it is a very simple manipulation, but mm. the students should get involved, wet their hands, mm -hmm. and then they get the excitement and uh, it's good for everybody. Okay, that's the concept. So now, as a small community, we'll start from the university. As you said, we are training the students. And uh, individually, the teachers, from the school level and the professors from college level, university level, they, they put up together, can't actually uh, give a good result because they will have to come in collaboration with the engineers or the company, industry people. Now these two again cannot do the job because somebody in the government should have to get convinced. So you have uh, in your presentation and in your talk, you had shown a lot of things which your government had done. How could you get convinced your government, which we would like to know also, so that we'll go about that way, at least to change a part of the scenario, so that the government is so convinced that they get involved in using the solar panels to do that. Well, I mean, uh, see, now the way we have been doing it is that uh, there is a national level support uh, to do whatever we want to do. Other one is uh, European level, international level of collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, uh, in Europe and uh, worldwide, so, so there is a big interest in uh, energy, renewable energies and the new market. Uh, that uh, the Swiss government, uh, through the National Science Foundation and other agencies, they have earmarked projects and money for working on renewable energy areas. And the same thing with Europe, the same thing with the international level, uh, that uh, we work at various levels. It's not just to the national level alone, European level and international. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in principle, uh, even in a place like Latin America, like here, you can have a national level networking with the involvement of the government and then a Latin American, Pan American uh, level interaction because there are some people who are advanced in some ways and uh, only when you go on networking you can identify the complementary expertise. Because these days uh, developing technology is uh, very complicated, multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you cannot find all the expertise need that you know on campus, it doesn't have to stop you from going. The other way is to go for a network collaboration. And that again, slowly you can, uh, but it doesn't have to be sequential. Okay. But you need to try parallelly that there is a regional networking, Latin American, Pan American networking, and then uh, international. When you do that, then we now uh, we get uh, easily Chinese and Taiwanese and Korean to collaborate. Correct. Uh, because they see that there are some benefits mm -hmm. uh, that they don't have to do everything themselves. Good. 
and we don't have to do everything. This is what the Americans call as a win-win situation. Okay. Uh, you go for a collaboration where I benefit better than you benefit. There is no loser here. Yes. Okay. And this is what we call as a win-win situation. And uh, so with the networking, you can do that. Okay. That's what we try to do. Mm. Sir, you are working from from past uh, years, you know, Dyson C solar cells, third third generation solar cells. How we can reduce the cost of this Dyson C solar cells or third generation solar cells, comparatively silicon based solar cells? Well, the uh, material cost is one, and uh, <coughs> of course, for any technology, when uh, there is this most love, when the production goes by orders of magnitude, then per piece the cost comes down. As people have shown with semiconductor chips and all variety of things. And solar cells also is expected, and it has come down in silicon and cadmium telluride. And uh, so the nice solar cells also, the prices will come down by the sheer volume of production. But then also, now with the time, we have more choice of all the components, anode, cathode, electrolytes, and dyes. Uh, the hope is that I can find a combination of low-cost materials so they can also, in addition to lowering the cost of mass production, I can also go in for uh, best performing but low-cost uh, reagents, I can bring the cost down. Then I think that compulsory can you have only one material, one way of growing. But uh, disolar cell is an open box. Different materials. So I have a template, I have a model of how I put together. But there is no compulsion that the cathode should be a platinum spectrum or an electrolyte should be this one. So I have a big tunability and uh, suddenly when the cost question comes, right now the focus is on increased efficiency. Hmm. And the cost comes, then I can go into the table and then pick. Of the cost down. So there is a scope there for okay. that comes next year. Thank you. Uh, glad to meet you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Um, actually, how this uh, DSSE uh, will work uh, the country like Chile, where the most of the days are cloudy days, more than six months, how this will work? The nice thing, our main distinguishing feature of dye solar cell compared to silicon or even it's a thin film, uh, crystal based or wafer based materials, is that uh, it doesn't depend on the uh, angle of incidence of the radiation. So it responds equally well to diffuse light and to direct light. And uh, people are only just, for example, in England is a typical case where it, the number of sunny days without clouds is very small. So more than half the year is uh, cloudy, wet, rain, fog. And uh, that kind of climate, uh, the DSG has been shown to work very well. And uh, because it responds to diffuse light. And uh, there is no temperature dependence, which is again is a serious issue with the silicon. So with the limited experiments people have done in different places, um, the DSC is well suited for all climates, mm -hmm. bright sunny as well as uh, cloudy, wet, uh, tropical regions. The, the one thing with tropical, even in Singapore, it happens that tropical regions get a lot of cloud rains also. So it's not just, tropical does not necessarily mean sunny days all the time. Yes, but it works. Okay. Thank you.